All right, so if imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, Elon SpaceX must be very pleased with the Chinese space program. If you're getting deja vu while looking at this design, you're not wrong. The resemblance is stunning. It bears an uncanny similarity to SpaceX's Starship, currently the world's largest rocket. To be honest, China seems to have cloned SpaceX's Starship. With that said, what could Elon's reaction be to this? Let's find out more in today's episode of Alpha Tech. When China began to seriously aim to send astronauts to the moon in the mid-2010s, its senior rocket scientists started planning the development of a large booster rocket to carry out the mission. At that time, China's heavy lift rocket looked a bit similar to the large heavy lift rocket NASA was designing, the Space Launch System. The rocket was fully expendable with three stages and solid boosters attached to the sides. However, as SpaceX began achieving milestones in reusability with kerosene-powered first stages and delving into the development of a fully reusable Starship, China started rethinking their heavy lift rocket plans. In various presentations over the last couple of years, Chinese officials have repeatedly discussed incorporating reusable components into the Long March 9 design. After all, China has now refined the rocket design to include a reusable first stage. Now, based on info released at a major air show in Zhuhai, China, the design has changed again. This time, Long March 9 rocket appears almost identical to the Starship. According to the latest specs, Long March 9 will have a fully reusable first stage powered by 30 YF215 engines. These are full-flow stage combustion engines fueled by methane and liquid oxygen, each given about 200 tons of thrust. By comparison, Starship's first stage is powered by 33 Raptors, also fueled by methane and liquid oxygen, each generating around 280 tons of thrust. The new specifications also outline a fully reusable rocket config with an upper stage that looks very similar to Starship's second stage, complete with the flaps in the same positions. According to the Airshow presentation, China wants to fly this vehicle for the first time in 2033, nearly a decade from now. In response, Elon, the creator of Starship, commented with a laid-back attitude. Interesting. Well, I think China's smart to aim for a fully reusable rocket. Other countries should also do so. It's a fundamental breakthrough needed to make life multiplanetary. Historically, Elon has been very open and has encouraged other rocket companies to follow SpaceX's lead to promote collective advancement, unlike some competitors, like Blue Origin, who have often feared others might steal their techniques, which arguably just aren't that groundbreaking. Quite frankly, this isn't the first time the Chinese rocket programs have drawn inspiration from SpaceX. The pattern became evident when Space Pioneer announced plans to develop their own version of the Falcon 9, representing just one instance in a broader trend of technological adaptation. Both state-operated space agencies and private Chinese aerospace companies appear to be following SpaceX's playbook closely. From design philosophies to operational practices, the influence is clear across multiple aspects of their space programs. The systematic nature of this approach suggests a coordinated effort to accelerate development. The similarities extend across multiple technical domains. Chinese companies are pursuing reusable rocket technology, developing vertical landing capabilities, and designing cargo and crew capsules that bear striking resemblance to SpaceX's models. Even their manufacturing process and testing protocols show some notable parallels. A recent example from last week saw China's semi-private space startup Cosmoleap announcing plans to develop a fully reusable rocket named Leap in the next few years. In the announcement accompanied by a video, the company stated that it's adopting a new tower and chopstick landing method, which SpaceX first demoed with Starship System last month. On top of that, several other Chinese companies are conducting basic trials to prep for launches where they can land their rocket boosters like SpaceX. Overall, the Chinese space industry has adopted a pragmatic strategy, carefully studying SpaceX's successes and failures and then implementing proven solutions. Rather than starting from scratch, they're leveraging existing knowledge to accelerate their progress in the space sector. This fast follower approach isn't unique to the space sector. It's a common practice in emerging industries where one company has established clear technological leadership. However, the scale and systematic nature of China's approach in the aerospace sector makes this case particularly noteworthy. This strategy raises important questions about the future of space exploration and innovation. While it may accelerate short-term progress, the long-term implications for technological advancement and internal space cooperation have yet to be seen. The question of whether China's approach will foster genuine innovation or leave the space industry permanently a step behind the U.S. is pretty complex, especially due to recent setbacks experienced by Chinese private space companies.
Despite the rapid adoption of SpaceX's pioneering technologies, many of these companies have struggled with replicating them effectively. Several test failures illustrate the significant challenges in achieving reusability and reliability, two core tenets of SpaceX. For example, in June, China's space pioneer attempted a static fire test for the first stage of its Qianglang-3 rocket. Typically, a static fire keeps the rocket anchored to the pad, but the Qianglang-3 unexpectedly lifted off, lost control, and then crashed. This mishap suggests a lack of precise control mechanisms and exemplifies the risks involved in a clumsy replication attempt of China's companies. The Nebula 1 rocket by Deep Blue Aerospace, although impressive, ended in a crash during its landing test, highlighting the difficulty of perfecting landing procedures. These failures have raised concerns about safety, especially as some Chinese rockets have landed far from intended recovery zones, potentially endangering local wildlife and ecosystems. With current projections from industry experts, it could take until 2030 for China to match SpaceX's current cadence. By that time, SpaceX may well be deploying a Starship, the world's largest rocket on missions to Mars, leaving China's space sector still catching up. However, a reversal of fortune is not impossible, as the U.S. and China are engaging in a new space race with a different motivation than the first one. This time, the goal isn't simply to reach the moon, but to establish a sustainable and long-term presence there. Both nations recognize the importance of reusables as a key to success. China is showing flexibility in its strategy by developing two parallel rocket lines. The Long March 10 is designed for short-term missions, while the reusable Long March 9 is aimed at more complex and long-term operations. This approach indicates that China is balancing immediate needs with a long-term vision. In the U.S., the situation is a bit more complex, with two major programs running side-by-side. -side. SpaceX, with the Starship, is advancing towards full reusability, while NASA continues funding the costly SLS program. This divide could impact America's competitiveness. The Lunar South Pole is becoming the focal point of this race for specific reasons. The craters in this region are thought to contain ice, a valuable resource for sustaining life and making rocket fuel. Moreover, the usable area in this region is quite limited, making it crucial to secure advantageous positions. The success factor in this race is not speed, but sustainability. The nation that develops a cost-effective reusable space transport system gains a decisive advantage, requiring not only advanced technology, but also a complex logistics ecosystem. The private sector's role is increasingly important. SpaceX has shown that private companies can innovate and develop space technology more efficient than the government. China is also encouraging the development of private space companies, though they remain under tight state control. However, the Chinese government is pushing aggressively to advance its space ambitions and take a leading role in the field. The sharp increase in space spending is another clear sign of their ambition, with expenditures rising to $19.5 billion this year, although still lagging behind the U.S., which spent around $100 billion last year. China's investments are yielding results, not only in state-led programs, but also their commercial sector, driving progress in technologies like design propulsion systems and robotics. International cooperation will play a significant role in shaping the future of this race. In the last eight years, China has signed at least 46 agreements with 19 countries to promote global space collaboration. In 2016, they signed a memorandum of understanding with the UN for Outer Space Affairs to open a Tiangyang space station for use by all UN member countries. In April, that UN director praised China's cooperative efforts on the space station. China's also worked closely with Russia, a major but weakened space power. The International Lunar Research System is a joint initiative by China and Russia to establish a base at the moon's south pole. The plan is for ILRS to be fully operational by 2050, doing lunar research with its lunar launch pad supporting crewed interplanetary missions. Ten countries have signed on to support ILRS. The growing partnership around ILRS is seen as a competitor to the U.S.-led Artemis Accords. These non-binding accords reinforce provisions in the 1967 Outer Space Treaty based on U.S. interpretations regarding resource exploitation permitted by the treaty. 39 countries have signed the accords. However, some of these countries, like France, Germany, India, and Japan, have also joined China on projects related to the final module of the Tiangong Space Station. However, after all, whether China can surpass the U.S. remains to be seen. Oh my goodness, this is not an animation. 
This is an actual video of a rocket from a Chinese company just released, and as we can see, it could be considered a partial success when we compare it to SpaceX's Starship test back in 2021. The development of imitation, yeah, that's inevitable, but the question is, can they actually surpass SpaceX? When and how are Chinese rocket companies going to truly catch up with SpaceX? Okay, so to answer the question, we first need to take a close look at the latest test by the Chinese. Deep Blue Aerospace carried out the test September 22nd at the firm's Ejen Banner spaceport in Inner Mongolia using a Nebula 1 rocket first stage. Footage of the vertical liftoff and landing test shows the rocket going up to a predetermined altitude of about 5 kilometers before shutting off two of the three engines used during the 179-second flight. After the landing legs deployed as planned and the stage hovered above its designated landing site, Ultimately, an anomaly during the final engine shutdown led to a higher-than-expected landing altitude, resulting in an explosion that destroyed the rocket. Now, despite this failure, Deep Blue Aerospace emphasized the positives, saying that their Nebula 1 stage completed 10 out of 11 key verification tests set for the flight, reporting a landing precision of about 0.5 meters. On top of that, improvements in attitude control, trajectory optimization, and pinpoint navigation were successfully tested. Now, notably, this test was China's first high-altitude vertical takeoff, vertical landing test, using an orbital rocket stage. The company is now preparing for another VTVL test planned next month. This explosive landing brings to mind SpaceX's early efforts to test reusability of their rockets, where even the explosions were seen as semi-victories. It seems Deep Blue Aerospace is copying quite a bit from SpaceX, both technically and in terms of PR, with flashy public demonstrations, a rather different approach than what we typically see from Chinese space companies. Nebula 1 is 11 feet wide, slightly smaller than the Falcon 9, which is 12 feet in diameter, and once it gets certified, Nebula 1 can carry 4,000 pounds to lower Earth orbit. An upgraded version could lift 17,000 pounds. While smaller compared to the Falcon 9, it can carry around 55,000 pounds to LEL, and its Falcon Heavy's 141,000 pound capacity, the growth of the young company never stops. The Chinese firm's also working on a larger Nebula 2, which will be able to carry 20,000 kilos to LEO. Nebula uses Thunder R kerosene liquid oxygen engines in the first stage, three of which were used in the VTVL test flight. It was fueled at about one-fifth its capacity. Deep Blue Aerospace says this is a step towards a 100-kilometer high-altitude recovery test and subsequent orbital launch and recovery missions. Recently, another commercial company, Landspace, carried out a 10-kilometer test with a Zook-3 rocket, including an engine restart. This activity is happening in China as they seek reusable rocket capabilities and increase launch capacity to compete more aggressively with the U.S. launch industry, specifically SpaceX. Since 2017, SpaceX launched commercial payloads frequently using fully reusables like Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, allowing the company to offer low-cost launches in a shorter amount of time while building a network of over 6,000 Starlink satellites globally so far. In 2023, SpaceX did 98 space launches compared to 67 in China and 19 in Russia. Plus, SpaceX has placed significantly more payload mass in orbit, 1,195 tons, about 80% of the global total. Furthermore, the cost of launching Falcon is capped at 3,000 per kilo, which is a lot lower than other commercial space travel market averages of $10,000 to $20,000 per kilogram. This gives SpaceX and, by extension, the United States a substantial cost advantage over single use, enabling a steady frequency of launches around the year. Chinese companies claim that they're on the verge of a sustainable breakthrough, with rockets like Deep Blue's Nebula 1 or similar prototypes being developed. While China's dominated manufacturing in many other industries, mass-producing rockets is a bit of another challenge that they need to conquer. The goal is not to just catch up with SpaceX, but to ultimately beat Elon at his own game. For China, it's a matter of national pride and security. President Xi Jinping's government wants a healthy commercial space industry that can meet domestic needs and compete with the U.S. for customers and influence across the globe. As a result, Landscape and Deep Blue aren't the only two companies following Elon's footsteps trying to develop reusables. Subsidiaries of the Chinese Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation, or CASC for short, and the Chinese Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation, that's CASIC, also did similar tests earlier this year. Shanghai Academy of Spaceflight Technology has an ambitious goal of launching its first reusable next year. Certainly, China's deep pockets are supporting its space industry. According to the CIA's World Factbook, their government spent $14 billion on its space program last year, with most of that money going to state-owned enterprises like the aforementioned CASC and CASCIC.
China's private space companies are subsidized through investments of government-backed funds and use publicly funded launch facilities. Back in Feb, the government announced the opening of a reusable rocket technology center in Beijing and support startups. In terms of the importance, take a close look at countries and adversaries. Where are they investing? They're investing in space, says Tim Keating, chief strategy officer for UC Aerospace, at a U.S. Chamber of Commerce annual aerospace summit in Washington last month. In fact, I think China is actually in front of us. You look at the investment and you know it's not being placed just for someone's health. So I'd say the one telltale sign that we have a problem. Deep Blue in July announced it raised nearly $141 million from Chinese investors, such as government-backed high-tech zone in Wuxi, a city near Shanghai. Rival Orient Space in January raised $600 million in a funding round that included another local government's fund. And Galactic Energy last December said they raised 1.1 billion yuan from local investors. But China's government has been very supportive of the sector. It remains to be seen if the country can actually nurture a national champion capable of beating SpaceX at their own game. And to be honest, every company says they want to be China's SpaceX. But let's be realistic, they're not all doing that well. Even with massive investment from the Chinese government, their launch industry still might not develop like SpaceX. What SpaceX achieved today is the result of many different factors, mostly due to Elon. He had enough money to start the company, but not enough for them to try and buy out everything. So they were a very, very struggling startup, always looking for cheaper, simpler, and faster ways of doing things. That's been Elon's life for many years. He's found the right people, always happy to be agile, abandoned sunk costs if it could save something, and gave people autonomy and responsibility. Always looking to act fast, fail early, fail fast, fail cheaply, learn, and move on. They had two major failures, and he spent his last dime on the third launch instead of giving up. Another part of it is NASA, which has long known that better could be done than the clunky spacecraft launch monopoly the U.S. had to rely on. So they set up a technology transfer program. In short, they help you with all their hard-earned knowledge and expertise, and if you show promise, they'll be your first customer. Then if things go well, they'll buy more ambitious launches from you, and so on. SpaceX has got a good relationship with NASA right now, and much of that credit goes to SpaceX COO Gwen Shotwell, an extraordinary refined woman, particularly skilled in diplomacy. When the United States requested proposals for a vehicle to send people back to the moon, the quality of SpaceX's submission was much higher, not just in ambition and feasibility of the vehicle, but also in how closely it resembled what NASA wanted to see. I bet that speaking NASA's language in that way it paid off behind the scenes all along, and Shotwell actually deserves much more praise. Part of it's also timing in a rather ripe industry right now. Reusability was a selling point of the space shuttle. However, it didn't pan out, even though the project was an engineering marvel. The project also got caught up in politics, creating inefficiencies like pork barrel spending. Shuttle components were made all over the place and then shipped at great expense, just to gain more support in Congress. Perhaps it was the specific characteristics of the rocket launch market that allowed SpaceX to do reusability correctly, rather than reusability being something they cracked and then led to their success. It's a much deeper structural challenge than just landing your boosters, and in itself guarantees nothing. Every rocket company on Earth right now is playing catch-up. The big dogs still haven't caught up with SpaceX, and so far only Rocket Lab recovered the first stages of Electron, a smaller launcher. And while they've reused components on new flights, they have yet to successfully capture and retain a booster by helicopter and have not flown a first stage since. Every other company is playing catch-up, including U.S. companies like ULA and Blue Origin, while the ESA still lags far behind. Chinese rockets are very capable, and they fly a lot, so they definitely should not be mocked. The biggest issue with the Chinese is the safety of the people on the ground, whether it's dropping stages near their own villages from inland launch sites or leaving the core stages of the Long March 5B to re-enter uncontrolled at random points across the globe. And that's it for today's episode. As always, we thank you so much for making it to the end of the episode, and we hope to see you back here next time. Take care, stay safe, and God bless you. Bye.